I wasn't happy that he wasn't going to pay me. He had the attitude that uh, nobody could hurt him. I think he was wrong. Today we're going to talk about Richard Kuklinski. He was a hitman for the mob and went to prison for the rest of his life. Greg, why don't you tell us about the videos we're going to watch? Yeah, so HBO recorded two sets of videos about Kuklinski, one in 92, one in 2003. This is the 92, the less sophisticated Kuklinski. He was called the Iceman because he put bodies in freezers. And in one case, he left one in there too long before he dropped it. And that's how he was discovered. We'll leave it at that. All right, please subscribe and hit the like button and hit the little bell down there so you know we have a new episode come out. All right, you guys ready? Yeah, let's do it. Here we go. How many people have you killed? I mean, an approximate guess. Approximate will go with more than 100. All right, Greg, what do you got? He starts off with this, let's see. He twists his forehead. He does this little wrenching his mouth thing, which I think we're going to see as an adapter as he moves through this whole thing. By adapter, I mean a way to release nervous energy to make the uncomfortable comfortable. He exposes his lower teeth a little, looks down right. He's got this request for approval as he raises his head. And then he goes, approximately, we would go at more than 100. I don't believe he killed 100 people. I, clearly, the guy killed people. And after I watched this, I went and started digging to try to figure out whether other people believe he killed over 100. And the FBI says, probably not, probably 15, they'll give him 15. And it depends on who you read. But he then blinks, he blinks and makes eye contact to see the approval. Then he drops down to the right. And we see him kind of going back to an emotional state. What I think we're seeing here is a guy looking for some approval. And I think what we're having here is the beginning of a narcissistic personality type getting a mirror. Once people start admiring him, if you go watch the second 2003 video, he's a very different person. So I think what we're seeing here is him working to see what, what he can get. As a matter of fact, when he says um, that he hundreds, I guess, he does a little bit of a lip retraction or, or a little bit of a purse lip, sorry, for disapproval. I, I don't think he's killed hundreds, but that's what I think. Chase, what do you got? Yeah, one thing uh, Scott and I have discussed in another video is this expretching is what Scott named it. So over time, if we do a lot of facial expressions throughout our life, somebody's happy all the time. You can see that kind of etched in the wrinkles of their face after the age of like 30, 25 sometimes. If they're sad all the time, you can see that kind of etching itself into the person's face over time. This guy has no wrinkles in his forehead. This guy, until he was probably captured, has not sought approval from anybody. And he hasn't been very communicative with his face, most likely because the, those emotions aren't natural for him. And we're going to talk about the psychopath's emotions uh, in a minute. But I think this is, except for the number here, we see some recall at 8 o'clock. And we see his eyes move over in that direction. So we're getting a baseline, but it might be a baseline for deception. So that's when we have to keep asking questions here. His eye contact uh, stays and I think that's also, Greg said it was for approval. I totally agree. But I think there's a second layer to this, that he enjoyed the emotional reaction of the interviewer to what he was saying, how many people he killed. And I think this also probably speaks to the other part of his life where he probably enjoyed the emotional reaction of victims uh, to his killing. And I think th this whole concept of psychopathy, it's not... Uh, in the DSM, but it can be traced back to this guy named Pinnell. Uh, and he, this was in 1792, and he labeled this psychopath condition. It was originally called madness without delirium. And I'm going to give you one tip on uh, how to spot a psychopath in conversation. This is not a way to do it instantly, but these need to stack up. So I'll give you one for every video. Psychopaths are much more likely to focus their language on food, sex, and money. And just think of the bottom uh, few rows of the Maslow's hierarchy of needs. That's where most conversations will be focused. And that's also the questions they will ask you as a person. So that is red flag number one. We'll do number two in the next video. Scott, what do you got? 
All right. Well, I think this is going to be a great example of how of the differences in a sociopath or what people term a sociopath, which is what I. So there are no sociopaths, just so you know. Sociopaths are just hardcore criminals. They go to prison early. They kill people or they get killed early. A lot of a lot of times, it's stabbing those types of things. Really gross, really violent people. But they have, but their brain is intact. Their amygdala are formed as they are supposed to form. But they act differently because they weren't brought up with um, love and attention, and the uh, emotions weren't um, nurtured as a child when they grew up. So we're going to see the difference in one of those and a true psychopath in 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 these videos as as we go along. So after the question, there's this long pause, and he does this really really odd mouth gesture. And we see him do this a couple of times where he kind of pulls on his mouth. And I think that is an adapter. And I think, and these things that we're seeing in this video, and as short as it was, let you know there's an issue there. There's an issue with the answer. And he's trying to structure his answer. He's trying, I, I believe, I'm under the impression he's deciding what he's going to say. And he's come to a little juncture here where he's going to say, or a juncture where he's going to say, I did this or I did this. And I and so he makes his decision and he goes with it. And whether all these things are, are true or not, I agree with you guys so far. We have to pay attention to the deceptive uh, cues we see here. And we're, all these things tell us there that he has issues with what he's saying. That not because he doesn't want to say it because he'll get in trouble, because he's already in trouble. He's gone away forever. They've already said, dude, you're never getting out. We don't care what happens. You're in here forever. That's it. You're done. So moving forward, we'll... we'll will pick apart those things that, that, that differentiate a true psychopath, the clinical psychopath, who, whose amygdala, the part of the, of the limbic system that don't function properly, that let you have empathy and sympathy for other people and be able to feel for other people, whether those are functioning properly or not due to a clinical part, was the person born that way or were they raised that way, nature versus nurture. That's, where, that's the road I'll be going down on this. Mark, what do you got? Yeah, so first off, just the, the rhythm of him. He's not in a hurry, is he? Like, he's super relaxed, not in a hurry at all. So let's just keep that in our, in our mind. That's his general kind of demeanor. Uh, the first thing that hit me about this, and, it, and it's about um, how we decide who we are or who we're going to project. And immediately I went, well, hang on, this is Marlon Brando. This is Kurtz. This is the Godfather. And almost down to a T, almost down to a T. And so I instantly go, what if, because I don't know, but what if this is a character that he's playing? What if he's worked out that if he comes across as Marlon Brando in The Godfather or uh, Kurtz in Apocalypse Now, that that's quite scary for people because they've already got this idea lodged in their head. So look, that's either true or false or, or something in between. But I'm going to follow this trail of is he performing, uh, as Chase might say, a mask for us? And, and why that particular mask? And if so, why? Why is he performing this particular caricature or almost superhero, this almost Superman, um, you know, rather like, and, 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 but by the way, I don't know this. I don't know what this guy has done. I only picked up that I'd never seen him before. It was only like, ah, oh, he's killed a hundred people. So he says, I, I don't know. I'm with you, Greg. I was like, yeah, I think you're being the superhero right now that's that's the superhero version of that's the marlon brando version of what you what you did so i'm a little suspicious of this guy right up front seems very casual almost even apathetic to a caricatured um point uh point yeah there you go how many people have you killed I mean, an approximate guess. Approximate will go with more than a hundred. All right. How do you feel about killing? I don't. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me at all. I don't have a feeling one way or the other. I think if I had a choice, I wouldn't. All right, Mark, what do you got? 
Yeah, I don't. I don't, he says. Very clear. I don't. But then he adapts in the chair. It's like, hmm, possibly not then. Possibly you do. Or something else. Like, I don't know, but possibly not I don't. I don't buy I don't because of the adaption, that the movement in that chair. I don't buy it uh, at all. He protests too much. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me at all. Hey, you, 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 you just the first time would have been fine, my friend. You didn't need to say it again and the at all. Like, why do you want to let me know that it doesn't bother you? A lot of vocal clicks along the way as well. And we're going to see those build up over the time. Uh, if I had a choice, I wouldn't. So he's now putting forward the idea of it's not him, it's the pressures around him. He is a product of society. So you could go, okay, so if there's, if he's breaking rules, you know, in a bad, bad way, that would fit in with the sociopathic model. He just doesn't, his actions don't fit in with what society thinks at the time is the right way to behave. Obviously, this, this is performative and it, and it performs over time. It's different societies, different times think different uh, behaviours are good and bad. And But in this particular time, it's generally bad, you know, to kill, you know, more than zero people. <laughs> You know, so so ultimately, um, he's he's go he's going. I'm a product of circumstance. So here's what I do. I go. I don't I don't buy what you're saying because too much happened there in terms of adapting and vocal clicks and and let's blame society. So uh, if you had a choice, if I had a choice, I wouldn't. So what drives you? What is driving this? What bothers you? What are you saying about the world outside that bothers you enough that you had to do this? That's just the way my inquiry goes. I now start to want to know from him, what is it about this outside world that so bothers you that you had to do this? There, uh, Greg, what do you got? Yeah, I'm with you. Um, he says way too much. Um, well, no, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me at all. In fact, it doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me at all. It sounds that silly to me when I hear it. He, um, at how do you feel, his chin goes down, which we typically associate with shame or guilt or something to protect the throat. And that's in our DNA. He licks his lips. Either that's a tongue jut or it's grooming or it's whatever you want to call it. But he licks his lips. If you ask me about something I really don't care about, I'm going to say, don't care. My shoulders are probably going to rise. My body language is going to illustrate what I'm saying. His doesn't. His posture changes entirely. He crosses his legs. His, he breaks eye contact. His breathing changes. And then he says, I don't. His posture changes again. That's when he crosses his legs. His blink rate increases and his eyes drop down to his right, which I, and I'll always say this is as close as I get to an absolute, associate with internal or with emotional thinking, emotional thought. If I don't care, I'm certainly not going to emotion. I'd be like, I don't care. And then he does this taffy pull and a request for approval at the same time as he says, it doesn't bother me at all. Then he goes on and on about how much it doesn't bother him. And he says, if I had a choice and his lips retract back into his mouth, he's asking for approval there. For me, yeah, is he a bad guy? Did he kill some people? Yeah. Does that mean that he's the guy who killed 100 people and he's the most prolific hitman in history? Yeah, maybe not. But if you're already in jail and you want to be people to be afraid of you or you want notoriety so that the next time they talk to you, they pay your family or something. Of course, that that's a great option. If I kill 15, why not 100? If it if it bothered me, why wouldn't I say it didn't? Because I got nothing to gain, nothing to lose. That's always the point that nobody negotiates from a position of weakness. And what he's doing is creating this persona, this Iceman persona, so that he has something to sell. Scott, what do you got? All right. Yeah, I agree with you completely. After that question, he, like you were saying, he adjusts in his seat and then, and, and from discomfort. And this, this shows there's everything we're seeing. This one shows there's psychological discomfort here. He adjusts in his seat. He moves back, takes a deep breath, all these things. And he braces himself. These are red flags for emotional and psychological discomfort here. Um, psychopaths don't get emotional because they, they can't, there's no way for them to become emotional. Then he says, I don't have a feeling one way or the other when you ask him about, about murdering. His head moves to one side and then back to the other. And um, he's trying to be tough and stoic at all, all at the same time during this. All these things show us that, that, that he's dealing with an emotion in there. And he says, uh, if I had a choice, I wouldn't. And there's the truth because it bothers him. 
He didn't, he wouldn't want to want to do it. But if he but he but he did have a choice. But he didn't want to do it. You know, he didn't like doing it. He's not going to say that. Obviously, he doesn't ever say that because it comes on like oh, it doesn't bother him because it's supposed to be scary and stuff. But he's dealing with emotions here. We're seeing psychological discomfort and from the emotions he's feeling. That's what I'm getting. So again, we're going down that road. Is he a, is he a, a, a nature versus nurture psychopath or sociopath or whatever he calls a sociopath? That's the road I'm going down still. Chase, what do you got? <laughs> I caught myself early that time. <laughs> I was trying to look down to the other side because when I really look at you, it looks like I'm looking the wrong way. So I was looking down here. I didn't get to watch your face. I was just trying to look like I was into it. Dang I saw it. him go, damn it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay, go ahead. Again. No, we're going to save us. <laughs> All right. His clinical diagnosis uh, is a malignant narcissistic sociopath. And uh, psychopaths are nature and nurture. So we could have a genetic predisposition to psychopathy with a horrible childhood or trauma that makes those genes express themselves. Uh, but Scott, I do disagree that I think psychopaths absolutely can feel emotion, uh, but it's more muted uh, than most of us. Uh, but that's my opinion. Uh, Dude, it's just what, what are I, you saying? <laughs> what I learned in college. Okay. Um, and I did a little research here before we got on the video, uh, but I think all that we're seeing here is uh, th we're seeing this. De we're seeing deception. We're seeing him build a character. He he loves the name that he was given, and I think that yeah, just like uh, Mark, you said it. I think maybe there's some kind of benefit to him doing this, whatever it is. There's some genuine eye recall because I think he's actually thinking of the truth. And then he goes down to exactly what Greg said into that internal dialogue, that emotional recall. He's got that discomfort there with his body because he is crafting a story. And I think some some of the lip compression we're seeing here, we see the lips squeezed together. That typically means that a person is withholding information or opinions and we see that right at a key point in here. And I'll let you take a look at when you see the lip compression. But I think the eyebrow raise that we see in this one is uncommon for him. Just looking at his head, you can see it's uncommon. And I think it's seeking approval. And I also think he's looking for the emotional reaction of the interviewer here. So red flag number two to look for for psychopaths, whether or not we're dealing one in this video. They're very unlikely to drive any discussion into things like family, religion, or spirituality in a conversation if they're hiding their psychopathy or if they're hiding their illness. And this also, these are also on the scale for sociopathic individuals. That's all I got. How do you feel about killing? I don't. It doesn't bother me. It doesn't bother me at all. I don't have a feeling one way or the other. I think if I had a choice, I wouldn't. All right. There was a man, he was begging and pleading and, uh, and, and praying, I guess. And, um, He was pleased God and all over the place. So I told him he could have a half hour to pray to God. And if God could come down and change the circumstances, he'd have that time. But God never showed up. And he never changed the circumstances. And that was that. It wasn't too nice. But 
That's one thing I shouldn't have done that one. I shouldn't have done it that way. See, that's the one where I, when I first watched these, I was like, ah, something's up here. This is years ago when I saw that one. Mm -hmm. All right, Greg, what do you got? So in this case, there are a couple of things I want you to watch, and I'll show you why later, but that drawing the side of his mouth is an adapter. Like, Scott, you said the same thing in the very first video. I In the beginning, I was like, is he being sarcastic? What is he doing? But it, you'll see it. As we get later in the videos, we'll point out why we know for sure that's an adapter. His blink rate goes up when he's telling this story. This story, I actually believe. His emotional, he's got emotional eye accessing. He's milling his jaw. You can see his the muscles in his jaw milling. He is um, editing his thoughts as he goes through on what exactly to say. He's also managing his image as he goes through this. He's got this image he needs to keep up. His breathing changes. He makes no eye contact. He does a tongue jut at, a, at the right time for this to be a distasteful thing for him. And then when he does that thing on the side, that's controlling emotion or leaking nervous energy. In this case, I think it's emotion. I think he's fishing for approval from this guy for the bad guy that he is in a kind of a twisted way. It, Chase, to your point earlier, when we say a person is has this facade and this deception, it can be because they're trying to get more admiration for the bad guy that they are. In this case, I think that's the case. That's why I think he's exaggerated the number of people he's killed and that kind of thing. And it appears that many people believe that. Mark, what do you got? Uh, I've got somebody who looks like a bad knitwear catalog model, as far as I'm concerned. <laughs> <laughs> there he is in this, in this, I think, 80s, maybe colorful kind of piece of knitwear, looking off into the sunset. It's, 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 I, I expect him at some point to like point his, his, at his watch as well at the same time. I guess he probably doesn't have a watch, but, but point at his watch. It's, it's, it's such an act that's going on here from my point of view. Um, there's right up the front, there's so many different thoughts running through his head. If, if, um, if God could have come down and changed the circumstances. So now we've got God involved, okay? So if God could have come down and changed the circumstances, we see some vocal clicks around there. So I, I, I kind of get the sense he's maybe creating this really good look into the sunset story is if, you know, God could have come down and changed circumstances, things could have changed and he gave God a chance and God failed. <laughs> And so now somebody has to die. This is a very old story and an incredibly dramatic story, which is why I think this dramatic undercurrent of music goes so well in this look into the distance, is, is this is the test of God. This is when you say to God, hey, I don't think you're all that. I don't think you're gonna come and do anything. Come and have a go. God doesn't show up. And actually you're a little bit disappointed in God when that doesn't, doesn't happen. And so what happens is, is you wreak your revenge on the world because God has failed you. Okay, so he's created a very grand uh, story around here, around the testing uh, of the gods. It's, it's very kind of, certainly biblical, and, it, and it's very Greek as, as well. And so we get this lovely Greek statue in, 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 <laughs> in terrible 80s uh, knitwear. Um, speaking of great knitwear, Chase, what do you have? I've got some knitwear. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but uh, I think we're actually seeing, I, this is my opinion, I think we're seeing genuine regret here for a part of this. And we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, this is the only time we're going to see him displaying an eye flutter, which is most, most of the time we see that that suggests a person is protecting themselves from something they're saying or something that they're thinking about. Think about when your dog does it. Like if you get close to your dog's face, you start talking to your dog in a little bit louder tone of voice, you'll see their eyes start fluttering. There's some protection going on. And we're starting to see a pattern that he's making eye contact at the moments that the interviewer's reaction would make him feel powerful. And those are the moments that we're seeing a lot of eye contact, what, what Greg was just talking about a second ago. And he avoids any eye contact during vulnerable or sincere moments. So we're seeing him look away during all that. And Richard was raised as a Catholic and he had a seriously rough childhood. And I'm willing to bet that he probably prayed the same way as a child for God to show up 
and change circumstances uh, for him growing up. He was beaten. Uh, his siblings were beaten uh, by mom and dad both. And we're going to talk about that in uh, in the next video. Let me give you red flag, whatever number this is. Three. Psychopaths are a lot more likely than normal people to talk about unachievable goals almost in a way that makes you think they're already about to achieve them or have achieved them already, where normal people are more likely to talk about plans and hopeful goals and milestones that they need to hit or want to hit. So that's an interesting thing that we can see in usually a, a first conversation with a person. That's all I got. Scott. All right. Yeah, you're right. His father beat one of his brothers to death when he was little. And then when he took him to the hospital, he said um, he fell down the stairs. That's what he told the people at the hospital. So, yeah, really bad guy, really bad guy at home, even though he comes on like he's a, he was a great guy at home. Now, I agree with you, Chase. There is a there is a genetic disposition, we'll say, that when you when you show up in the world that you don't have, you're fearless, that you're very low uh, amount of fear and Thank God a lot of those people go on to be police officers and they go to the military and they become fighter pilots and test pilots and astronauts, those types of people. Their, their, their degree of fear they have is extremely low. And when you, when you group that together with somebody who's beating your brother to death and beating you up every day and beating your mother and beating everybody in the house up and just a royal, you know what, then that's the kind of, 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 psychopathy or sociopathy that that you see those kind of people come from in what I call the uh, nurture uh, psychopath or sociopath or what do you call them. So I agree with you. They the, the the emotions they feel as we talked about they go very small, very small. There's some there, not all, not in all of them, but in some they do have very small emotions they can feel and go through, but not to the degree that we're seeing here in this guy. That's why I'm going with with the nurture instead of nature on, the, on, on this part. Because when he says there was a man begging, that's when we see that eye flutter. And at this point, this indicates, again, he's struggling with something. He's struggling with with um, struggling to find the right words to, 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 to give out. I'm sure he's been asked these kind of questions before, and I'm sure in his mind he's thought up the answer, what he would say, but now he's having to structure these things and then send them out. So I think, so I agree with you. I think it's, we're, we're seeing that eye fluttering there. Uh, and the guy, and he says, and he was pleading, uh, you see that nostril flare, and as he breathes in, what was that? Cash. <laughs> <laughs> making money, boys. We're making money. Uh, that indicates there's an emotion in play at that point. And I think that's that may be anger, or it may be, uh, again, <laughs> regret, being angry at himself for, for, um, for, for doing something he wish he hadn't done. And this is that one where he says, I shouldn't have done this one that way. I was, I, I shouldn't have done that. When I first saw this one years ago, I said, okay, that's it. Because I saw, I think I saw the second one first. I was like, geez, this guy, he's either, or he's just, you know, this is the, the worst guy to ever walked the planet. But then after seeing this one later on, I was like, this guy is full of, so, uh, for a lot of it, not all of it, but for a lot of it. And like Mark said, this is acting. A lot of this stuff is like, He's trying to be a big, the, the hero in prison kind of thing. Um, but all these things we're seeing show that there are emotions in play there. When he says, um, when he talks about the guy, he was, uh, he says, um, and praying, I guess. Then we see that short breath out and a micro expression of contempt. And I don't know if that micro exp expression was for the guy or for him saying this or to the guy he's saying it to. He wish he hadn't said it. I can't figure that part out. Then we see the deep breath. And he adapts again with that bottom lip, and that again puts me on the on the trail of, of emotion. There, I think he's, and I'm focused on emotions because I'm really going hardcore, one way or the other. Nature versus nurture on this one. It was a man. He was begging and pleading, and uh, and and praying. I guess. And um, he was pleased God and all over the place. So I told him he could have a half hour to pray to God. And if God could come down and 
change the circumstances. He'd have that time. But God never showed up. And he never changed the circumstances. And that was that. It wasn't too nice. That's one thing I shouldn't have done, that one. I shouldn't have done it that way. The man owed me money. He was giving me a runaround. I told him I wasn't happy that he wasn't going to pay me. He had the attitude that uh, nobody could hurt him. I think he was wrong. All right, Chase, what do you got? One thing I noticed here right away is this lower eyelid here uh, squinting right at the words, nobody could hurt him. And we see this squinting in, uh, you know, old Western movies, like a cowboy, you know, meet me at, meet me at sunset out in the street kind of thing. And this typically denotes discomfort or anger. Learn this from uh, the grandfather, the godfather the father of body language, Joe Navarro. And I want you to use this. I want you to use this squinting, this lower eyelid squinting technique. You, when you watch somebody read through a contract or tell you about a previous relationship or a previous employer at a, a, a job interview, the squinting is going to tell you exactly what to ask the next question about as soon as you see that. So, Kuklinski's childhood was really bad. Both parents beat him, his siblings, his older brother, like Scott said, died of a head wound, said he fell down the stairs. His younger brother uh, was convicted of rape and murder of a 12-year-old. And his wife reported uh, that, you know, Richard was good and bad and that he never physically abused, but emotionally abused the kids. And there, there is a genetic a predisposition to psychopathy and child development has a major role in whether or not that's expressed. But uh, psychopaths have a reduced connections between and sociopaths in many cases, reduced connections between a part of the brain called the ventromedial prefrontal cortex. And this is just the part that's kind of responsible for sentiments like empathy, guilt, and that connection that has a problem is between that and the amygdala, which kind of mediates our, our levels of uh, fear and anxiety. So here's a uh, psychopath spotting tip. What number is it? I think it's four. 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 They're much less likely to mimic verbal and facial expressions during conversation. But if they've practiced a whole lot and they can mimic those things, you'll see a longer delay between your expression or your communication and their facial reaction. Because our normal ones, when you talk to somebody who has empathy, you'll see it right away because it's not thought of. It's not a conscious process. So that's all I got with that one. Mark, what do you think? Yeah, nice. Thank you. Um, was it going to pay me? I think we see disdain on that. So, you know, breaking of, breaking of a social code. Uh, the code is if you borrow money from this guy or whoever, I guess, his boss is, you pay. And so disdain suggests you're breaking the social code. So some understanding of, of a certain code. So understand my, my, my thoughts would be when it comes to sociopathy, it's, they're not being, they're antisocial, but it depends which society you belong to as to who's being antisocial. If you belong to the society who lent the money and said, look, pay it back with interest on a certain date, and you don't pay it back, then, you know, time to put some heat on, some pressure on. And now in one person's mind, that's not antisocial behavior. It's part of the social contract. Just don't get involved involved with the wrong society. You know, if, if you think that the, the penalty is antisocial, don't be involved in that society. Um, nobody could hurt him, he says. Nobody could hurt him. I think we see a 
chinge up there. And so there is some real uh, aggression in there. Uh, I think he was wrong. That's really a power statement. So I think what we're seeing in all around this is the challenge here to power. Just as we saw back in the past video, he's got this story, this big story of challenging God's power. Now he's got a story of challenging the power of somebody who's made a deal, doesn't want to pay back that deal, wants to renege, thinks they can take the punishment or will not be punished. And he says, I challenge that. And there you get punished. So a theme here of somebody who wants to challenge power, one very grand, almost kind of uh, fallen angel like in many ways. And this one, so, you know, big, that's a big uh, story to play uh, in a prison is basically to, go, basically to go, what you have here is Lucifer. What you have here is a fallen angel. What you have here is somebody who has, who has fallen from grace and is now challenging the gods at every root. Here you've got what you have here is somebody who, if you break the social code and you think you don't have to pay, I will challenge you and I will win. Straight down the line, though, big challenger. Greg, what do you got on this one? Yeah, so I'd, I'd reiterate that culture matters and what's acceptable in a culture if you live in a violent world is very different. Chase, I would say when you got promoted, whatever, E5, E6, E7, whenever you got promoted, you remember everyone who outranked you punching you in the shoulder as you walked down the line, right? That was just part of our culture. It's just one of those things. If you get wings or if you get some certain ranks, they'll drive the spikes from the back into your body. The, the more modern army people say, oh, you can't do that, I hear. But in my day, when you got ranked, you got it pounded in or you got wings, you got them pounded in. That's just part of it. So culture matters. In the case of a very violent culture, it's acceptable, Mark. I think that's a great call out. This whole video, this video ends, if you watch the very end, with some mild contempt. You see that lip rise just a bit. I'm not sure who it's for, whether it's for the guy that he killed, injured, whatever, or it's for the guy he's talking to. There's sarcasm in the smirk when he's talking about the guy. He does something that I have a friend does this when he's making a point. He does the whole moving his, and I don't think it's because he's feeling stress or fear. It, this guy, every time he makes a point, just before he makes a point, he'll go, well, and it's just a behavior pattern for that guy. I think that's what we're seeing here. I believe this story. I believe he went and took, you know, took out some kind of vengeance on a guy who didn't pay him. And you can tell because his speaking is less labored. There's less emotion to it. It's probably something he felt justified for. And it's more smooth. I think it's it's a fairly easy one to follow. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, in the comments, because I y'all comment on this. I think Greg looks a little bit more friendly when he's wearing uh a jacket and a shirt and a button-up oh, shirt like that. Shucks. So I think <laughs> I think it looks look less threatening, Greg. It's Good. just my I'll start my dressing this way all the time. <laughs> okay, I dare you. <laughs> okay, you know, when coming into there when he's talking about the guy not you know the guy owning money. What happened was this guy was a really low end. Um, like uh, the guy who got your money. If you if you owed money, he went and got. It. He was that guy. Break your leg, break your knee, whatever it was. Pop your knee out, and and he had a, a sheet four feet long, B and E's and everything. All these small small comparatively crimes. So he's trying. So he he couldn't be in the mob, but he could be hired by the mob. He could be a, a, an outside contractor because he was an Italian. You can't get in if you're not Italian. So that was a big a big problem he had with that. He couldn't get in, but he was always on the outskirts of it, so he wasn't really in. So he liked to feel like he was in. Uh, so his lips are pursed to the side, and he breathes out a little bit and has that little micro expression of a smile because he's he's almost dismissing this guy, showing his his uh, dominance, his narcissistic dominance over this guy. You know that's why his head goes back. Next. Uh, is it, with the flared nostrils, nostrils as well, as well, because I believe he was probably mad, you know, or had to be mad to go do this. But we're seeing a lot of these narcissistic things come out as they will in this personality type. We know the chin jet and the head jet, of course, that's aggression, and, and that that suggests or indicates that that you know, anger towards that guy. I don't think it's toward the the, the, the guy talking and asking the questions or anything. And uh, all this leads up to. Anger toward the guy that that he that he killed. I believe that's what it is. And going back to, to mimicking Chase, because that's one of my favorite things to talk about as well. What they will mimic, as you know, is they will mimic you. They'll watch you and see your your emotions, and then if you get mad about something, you, later on they'll go get mad about it somewhere else and sort of rehearse this emotion and let people see it, so it looks like they have 
that emotion or are, are, are experiencing that or happiness, where the thing was. And they'll say the exact same thing as you will quite often. I, I've heard a guy, I've told that story before, where I heard a guy do it in the booth sitting behind me. It was a guy I knew. And I was like, oh no. And started putting things together and found out a bunch of really horrible stuff about him. And he's loose in Canada. And don't worry, you won't be there very long there. They'll be coming for you. I always say that. We'll get you. <laughs> um, so that's what I got for that one. The man owed me money. He was giving me a runaround. I told him I wasn't happy that he wasn't going to pay me. He had the attitude that uh, nobody could hurt him. I think he was wrong. We good? Yeah, we're good. All right. What'd you do afterwards? I walked away, got in my car, and went home. What'd you do when you got home? I put toys together for the kids for Christmas. I saw the broadcast while I was putting the toys together that came down. Mob-related killing. That was the first time I knew I was mob related. <laughs> How'd you feel? I was annoyed I couldn't get the damn wagon together. All right. I'm going to go first on this one. It's going to be pretty short because I think he's full of it. I don't <laughs> think this happened anyway at all. Like he said, it happened. There's nothing there. He's not, he's he, at this point, he's trying to make stuff up. But he's, he's got nothing. And it wasn't the first time he learned he was mob-related because he knew he was mob-related because his first one of his first jobs for the mob was to off somebody. And this wasn't one of his first jobs. It, it describes that in the beginning of it and all the details that went into it. Of all these details he went through at the beginning of this, which you didn't get to hear, we should have put it in there. It was a little bit graphic. Um, then he comes up with this answer to these things. Nothing there. I don't, I don't, I'm not buying this at all. I don't know. So, uh, Mark, what do you got? Yeah, I agree. Too many vocal clicks in there. I mean, just there's, he get, I walked away, vocal click, and then there's just a succession of them after after that. So that immediately alerts me is there's some kind of stress going on uh, in this story. And I've got here, I got here in my note here, like this is a front. This is just he's just fronting it now completely. I believe. Uh, chin jut before mob related killing so i think he's wanting to see us off uh that idea like I, I didn't know i was anything to do with that now maybe that's a cultural thing like you can't say you know look i was part of this thing called called the mob that that's not a thing that you ever admit to i'm it may be something around that but certainly um again this challenger comes out uh Again, that's about the realest thing that I think we have there is this challenger comes again. He is it. He is on for a challenge. He is going to challenge authority, be it the uh, the highest, uh, you know, in the universe, if possible, or or somebody who's made a mistake within his society. He's going to challenge those. Laughs and checks the camera, you know, and I, and I that kind of alerted like why the laughter because that is often a release of tension. So what is well not not often it. Laughs after is always a release of of tension okay so so what is that tension about what did he have tension about around that uh, a look of approval there now how do you feel how do you feel is the question and i count around about four thoughts go through his head until he lands on the idea that that he lands on which is he was annoyed about not being able to do the you know, the kid's toy, you know, which is a lovely idea. Like it's a super lovely idea. Like all I could think about was how, how this kid's toy was really annoying me. It's like, oh, you're cold. You're cold. You are. Oh, you're a nasty one. You are, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, it's like it took him four goes to go, what can I land on on that one? I know didn't like the toys <laughs> you know so so yeah he is he is a misfit toy this one certainly but um yeah i'm not buying it not buying it at all still wouldn't like to be in a room with him but not buying him chase what do you got on this one 
So I, I can totally agree with you. And you guys got a lot of uh, a lot of what I had here. This is absolute BS. And you know what it sounds like? It sounds like an 80s movie. It sounds like something you would see from a script in the 80s and early 90s. And that's where the culture was at the time. So that's the story that he probably put together from from watching all that stuff in the media. We're still seeing his need to see the reactions of people. And we're seeing the eye contact and the kind of checking with the interviewer, checking with the camera to see to get some reaction only at the moments that he's feeling powerful and strong. And I think, again, this speaks to probably what I would estimate to be similar behavior with victims. And we're seeing the smile come up here right at the moment uh, that it's most creepy, that it would be most creepy for the camera about the mob. And there's this, I think, the perfect example here of the second type of squinting. So we're seeing discomfort this time and not anger with the same lower eyelid behavior. So this little lower eyelid squint, it was anger before or being a tough guy. And now we're seeing discomfort with the same squint. So now you get a chance to see the same eyelid movement under a different circumstance to see the two body language definitions of this behavior uh, right there. Uh, so let me give you one more uh, tip here. And this, I think this will be number five. Psychopaths and sociopaths are extremely rewards driven. And even in the face of severe consequences, they'll keep going through it. So when they're performing actions for reward, a psychopath's brain in particular can release up to four times the levels of dopamine that your brain and my brain can release. That's all I got. Greg? Yeah, his blink rate does increase. And it's interesting. It blink rate increases to start with, and then he makes real hard eye contact in a way he hasn't done up to now. He does that pursing of his lips a little bit. And I, I agree with you, Chase, with the eye squinting thing. I was... Actually, in my notes, I said, who does he think he's Clint Eastwood? Because he's got some snarky line for the, you know, he's squinting his eyes and he's got some snarky line for the wagon and that kind of stuff. And you're like, yeah, he closes with some self-amusement. You see him kind of doing a little almost like almost on the edge of Duper's Delight or something there. But he's got some self-amusement for sure. Not sure exactly why. But he's trying to get across that he's a hard ass, that he's this, that he's that. Now, the other one that I would say is exactly the line I was thinking of a line from from um oh, not apocalypse now what's the other one uh from joker recoil mm -hmm. uh i can't think of the mo name of the movie you know it well it's two movies but anyway a vietnam war movie no a vietnam mm. war movie it really starts off one way ends the other it's got uh, full metal on. jacket full metal jacket yeah there's a great mm -hmm. line what do you feel recoil that kind of line is what you're you're dead on exactly something from a movie to make him a hard ass i don't think any of us are buying that but I agree, I won't be in a room with a guy. Yeah. Just because he didn't kill 100 doesn't mean he didn't kill 15 and do horrible things. Yeah. That's all I got. All right. What'd you do afterwards? I walked away, got in my car, and went home. What'd you do when you got home? I put toys together for the kids for Christmas. I saw the broadcast while I was putting the toys together that came down. Mob-related killing. That was the first time I knew I was mob-related. <laughs> How'd you feel? I was annoyed I couldn't get the damn wagon together. I've never felt sorry for anything I've done other than hurting my family. The only thing I feel sorry for I'm not looking for forgiveness and I'm not repenting. No, I'm wrong. I do want my family to forgive me. Oh boy. I can make this one. Wow. 
This would never be me. This would not be me. I feel for my family. You see the Iceman cry. Not very macho. But I've heard people that mean everything to me. But the only people that mean anything to me. All right, Greg, what do you got? So at hurting my family, his breathing changes. You hear him start to change respiration. Then his blink rate change, you see his blink rate increase just a touch. He doesn't do a lot of blinking. He does that jaw milling thing we were talking about earlier. He's cr crunching his teeth together or something. So you see these jaw muscles flexing and relaxing and then you he does an expulsive kind of breath or a sigh and you can hear then that he's really choking back tears this is genuine whatever's causing it i mean guys if you've ever been in a place where you're trying to choke back tears everybody has their own style of doing that but you can hear the moisture in his in his mucous membranes starting to build up in his throat all that kind of thing and then you see if he were shaven you would see chase your chin boss that trembling at the chin and the lower mouth doing that and this is how we know that, that thing he does with his mouth all the time is an adapter and not just some kind of sarcasm or that because when he's trying to choke back that emotion he's doing that not to mention all the tongue between the teeth and all those things about distaste so here we see who the person really is from my angle if we talk about nurture versus nature and we believe that nature people who are born without the ability to process information and create the amygdala, the amygdala create the message i would think he's not that kind i would think he's just been so hardened by abuse that he can turn the stuff on and off so i think if i were choosing one of your guys ways we're talking about it, i would say nurture not nature that's just my point mark what do you got yeah so there's just too many kind of vocal clicks and you know stuff going on here uh and real emotion i absolutely agree that what i get is uh the stress of an internal battle going on and the battle i think is between the superhero that he's set up called the ice man uh which is a um he's a supervillain and and who 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 is um you know i, I think it's probably I, I didn't know about the the ice crystals uh, idea uh greg my assumption was it was about how what a cold killer uh, he is and i assume that's that's what led it to become you know his trademark is that it's like he is stone cold uh, icy cold emotionless and so i think he's trying to keep that persona in front of us or that mask in front of us and he's wrestling because internally he has real feelings for real people in his family and that's not to say that he didn't hurt those people uh as well it it is it is uh more than complicated it's it's complex and and um uh, and in no way should be celebrated so i'm not celebrating this behavior in any way whatsoever but there's a real internal battle going on there's real there's a wrestling match going on there's real empathy for that family um uh the ice man is a cover story you you see this digging of the teeth here which i think is not just withheld opinion not just like i'm not going to say this i don't want to let this out but i think it's probably a stimulation action in order to control the emotion he's going to cause himself some pain in his lips to bring his attention into that pain rather than the internal wrestling pain that's going on um uh, it's in interesting, though, how he still kind of transfers to you're seeing the Iceman cry rather than you're seeing me cry. So, I guess, so he is able to save it for himself. Probably, you know, he's going to have to, his, his, you know, the other inmates are going to see this and he's going to be able to say, well, that was the Iceman. 
I'm still the Iceman. The Iceman cried. So it's still the Iceman. He still says the Iceman exists. The Iceman hasn't melted because he's still got to go in with that story of I didn't, I didn't, there isn't a weak version of me. There's the Iceman now crying. So the, the Iceman is still here. Uh, still, at the end of the day, uh, still looks like a knitwear catalog model, uh, though. So still not as scary as he could be to somebody like like me who doesn't respect knitwear. Uh, I do respect Scott, though. Scott, what have you got? Thanks, Mark. I agree with you. He's talking about himself in the third person of this thing he's created that somebody else called him. Because like Greg was saying earlier, what he would do to, to uh, mess up the timeline on the, when the bodies were found on when they actually died, he would put them in a freezer, sometimes for a year, some, for quite a long time, and then go throw them out in the woods. But one time they found one too early, and like, hey, man, this guy's frozen. You know, there was ice inside this guy at, when they were doing the autopsy. So I think this this clip shows exactly why he's not the nature uh, psych psychopath, but he's more the nurture, quote unquote, psychopath, where it, because he has true feelings that are coming out here. We see a series of gestures and cues and expressions and verbalizations of emotion here and at sorrow, regret, regret and pain. We're seeing all those things in this. Um, the clenched jaw and those deep breaths and those, those heavy sighs, that tells you pretty much everything. And, and again, like you, you nailed it, Greg, we see that, the, the chin boss down there, we see that trembling down there. And we see tears. He's got tears in his eyes. One of the main things we hear here that goes against everything for the, even the, the clinical narcissist is where two times he says he was wrong. He says he was wrong. And he, about what he did because he hurt his family. And he says he, that, that hurting his family was, was the worst thing he's ever done, uh, obviously. Um, but he says, I was wrong two times. And I think that's, you're not going to hear that ever from a psychopath unless he's mimicking somebody, but I don't think he's mimicking this. Everything we saw here, these are all true emotions I think we're seeing at this point. So I don't think he's a clinical psychopath. I think he's the hardcore criminal who was raised in a violent with a violent upbringing, no love, no positive um, interactions, nothing like that from either one of his parents. And he went on to do that to his own family, not knowing the real difference, you know, and, because that's the way that usually travels through through generations, uh, people doing that. But that's why I think that we're, we're not seeing a true psychopath here. Because, although he did many of the same things a true psychopath would do, we're not seeing those behaviors here, uh, which are... True, not just a little bit of emotion, but a lot of emotion here. And you don't see that in a psychopath. Uh, Chase, what do you got? I was watching this this morning to Greg's comment about the uh, the chin boss movement here, which we you'll see this muscle quiver during grief and sometimes shame. And I, it was the first time that reminded me of the term bald faced lie. A person will tell a bald faced lie which refers to a person having no facial hair and still being willing uh, to be deceptive. Uh, but we definitely see that muscle in here. I think the majority of the sadness we're seeing here, I'm going to go out on a limb and I'm going to say this is self-pity sadness. This is like, I've done all of these things and look at me. I feel so bad. I'm ashamed. It had nothing to do with hurting them. It had to do with how he felt. It was all about him. And I think that was inward directed pity uh, that we're seeing there. I think it's also funny, uh, Scott, you were saying made a mistake and all this stuff. He's taken on the name Iceman, which he was named for because of a mistake. The whole thing right. oh. is, is because of a mistake. <laughs> yep. Hey, good uh, call. I think that's unusual, too, that he would do that. And maybe he doesn't even know why they say that. I don't know. It had to come up in prosecution. But uh, yeah. uh, I think that's pretty interesting. And I think, Scott, that speaks to your point as well. Most of the facial movements that we're seeing here, I think, are, are emotional redirection. And I think the chin boss does show us that's almost impossible to fake that level of chin bossery. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and psychopaths can feel some emotion sociopaths can feel some emotion but most of the time it's not like just like scott said it's not to the level that you're going to see here and typically uh according to peer-reviewed research the sadness and emotion that psychopaths can feel to an almost normal level is when it's about someone they care about or someone they're attached to like family members and things like that 
but 99% of the time, those emotions are severely muted. And the only regret will usually come from hurting someone close to them. And that's documented. And it had, and it was documented before this, this case ever took place. So disrespect, rejection by other people, and typically loss of control. And number one in all the research here, uh, in all the research that I, I looked through this morning, uh, was loneliness. Loneliness. And he even uses the word lonely in, in some of these interviews. Um, and not, not what we looked at tonight, but loneliness was one of the number one things that causes that uh, level of emotion in psychopath. So if you ever encounter one of these people, I'll teach you a quick trick here. And if you want to prevent yourself from being sold a product or being sold a human being, hold your chin while you're talking like this. It'll make you look interested and it will keep you from nodding when they are trying to get approval from you by nodding their head like this. It will keep you from doing that. Even look at these guys here. All three of them kept themselves from nodding and we nod to each other, the whole YouTube video and they stop. <laughs> so it'll keep you from nodding. It'll keep you from agreeing with a person. So finally, as our last way to spot a psychopath, they might display the wrong emotion on accident in response to good or bad information. My aunt just got in a car crash and they smile first and then correct it. Or we say some really great news. I'm just, just got tickets to go to Hawaii. We're going on this major vacation and they, and they had this big frown on their face and then correct it instantaneously or very quickly to the appropriate emotion that they've learned over time. I've never felt sorry for anything I've done other than hurting my family. The only thing I feel sorry for I'm not looking for forgiveness and I'm not repenting. No, I am wrong. I'm wrong. I do want my family to forgive me. Oh boy. I can make this one. Wow. This would never be me. This would not be me. I feel for my family. You see the Iceman cry. Not very macho. But I've heard people that mean everything to me. But the only people that mean anything to me. Okay, well, let's run around the room one time. We'll say what we th we'll wrap it up and say what we think about uh, this guy and these videos, and then we'll go one at a time. We'll start with Mark, and Chase, then Greg. Mark. Yeah, look, clearly he's a bad lad. Clearly there's nothing, you know, uh, uh, to celebrate about him. Uh, done some bad stuff, absolutely. Uh, but I'm not buying any of it from him, certainly not the degree that he's going to. There's a lot of story going on there, uh, a lot of masking to protect something, um, some, some quite strong feelings uh, inside there. Uh, and I'll say it again, he looks like an 80s knitwear catalog model. So I'm not that scared, not that scared of him. Chase, what do you got? I think he looks like an 80s knitwear catalog model. <laughs> I t totally agree with you. If you look throughout his entire life and everything that he's done to his family, his kids, all the killings, everything's about significance. And the moment that he got arrested, the only way to maintain a high level of significance 
is to create Iceman, to be Iceman and make it as bad and dangerous as possible. Because that's the, at that point, when you're locked up in a cell, that's the only way to become drastically more significant, which he thrives on. Greg? Hate to say it, but he's fulfilling his Maslow in his own little world where he gets to be the coolest bad guy he knows. That's all that is, is he's making himself more significant than he was. Ask yourself for just a minute. Go watch our Eileen Warnos video. Go watch our Richard Rodriguez video and tell me which of the three doesn't fit the mold. That's my only question. I think, yes, he may behave like a psychopath and he may behave like all of that, but, but I think it's a learned trait to your guys' point. It's a nature versus a nurture thing. Those folks, you make no mistake. Did you ever see a teardrop out of either one of those people's eyes? Laughter, maybe, not teardrops. So it's a very different mindset. I think the guy, yes, of course, he killed people. They know how many they, they can track. But I think he's self-aggrandizing. And, you know, that comes with the territory. I'm going to make myself bigger and cooler than I was. And it probably keeps people off you. And it gives you some notoriety. There's also at least one article I read that said the second more famous interview in 2003, his wife was paid handsomely for that. So there's a way to provide for your family while you're in prison. Scott, what do you got? Yeah, yeah, I think you nailed that one. Yeah, I think we're seeing this is a classic example of someone who everybody goes, oh, this guy's a psychopath, but he's not. He's not a clinical psychopath. He's a hardcore criminal who had a rough upbringing and was just a violent person. And those people end up in prison fairly early most of the time. This guy made it for a while. But uh, they end up being killed and killing somebody just out of anger and going to prison, whereas he planned all the ones he killed. And I don't think by any means that he killed over 100 people or even close to that. I think a lot of what we're seeing is like all you guys were saying. He's, he's acting. He's making a lot of this stuff up so he can be the Iceman. One thing I learned from being in the music business, being around people who are famous for a really long time, is they, they'll they start, those that sort of become detached from the earth, they start talking about themselves in the third person. And I think I've told you all the story about the one guy. Well, it was an elevator story that I've told you guys before. We'll, we'll go over it later. I can't tell it here. But these, he would talk about himself. That you want to go do this with, with this, with, and he would say his first name. And I've seen that time. And you'll see people on talk shows refer to, well, so-and-so doesn't do that kind of thing. He's not that kind of person. It's like, well, dude, are you talking about you? And that's what he's doing here. And you see that in these highly narcissistic personality types. Someone can start off normal and then turn into that. But in this case, I think he was, it, it started when he was little after being brought up in such a violent uh, family and violent uh, surroundings as he grew up. But I don't think he killed that many people. I think we've seen bald face lie here, like Chase was saying. And, I, and, I, and I, I don't think he's a psychopath. I think he's a hardcore criminal. That's what I think. All right. Well, if you like what we're doing, please subscribe and uh, hit the little bell down there after that. And I'll let you know we have a new video come out. I think this is a good one, fellas. And yeah. I'll see you next time. Thanks. See you. Bye now. Sí, no, 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 no,